Energetics specialize in creating sustainable, world-class dancewear for the stars of tomorrow. Perform and feel your best at every stage of your dance journey in Energetics premium high-performance fabrics. Try them out with a 20% discount site-wide using the code COD20 at the checkout, available until the end of September 2023. Shop their extensive range online at energetics.com. That's E N E R G E T I K S dot com and enjoy free express shipping on orders over $75. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden. And you're listening to Conversations on Dance. On today's episode of Conversations on Dance, we are joined by critic and dance scholar Alistair McCauley to talk about the incredible legacy of George Balanchine's Serenade. Originally choreographed in 1934 for students at the School of American Ballet, Serenade has gone on to become one of the most beloved works of the 20th century. Alistair takes us through the history of the ballet, including the myths surrounding its creation, the many changes it has gone through over the years, and why we should really all be pronouncing it Serenade. Great, Alistair. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so thrilled to have you back on the podcast. We've been Always a pleasure. We've been going through a few old episodes that we have were not able to transfer over when we changed our podcast feed. So one of the episodes that did not come over was an episode with you about Serenade. And it was always something that was very popular. And so we emailed you and we said, do you want us to republish it or should we do it again? And so we all decided to do it again. And so we're going to hit some of those points that we talked about before, but we're also going to find some new things that we know that you have discovered and uncovered. But before we start, I think the most important thing to talk about is, do we pronounce Serenade correctly? I was about to say this. Uh, <laughs> well, as you know, the Balanchine world does pronounce it serenade, and the Balanchine world is wrong, because the Balanchine himself, from at least the 1950s, was calling it serenade. And you can find him on in 1964. It's included in the two-part DVD Balanchine documentary that came out after his death, um, where he says, in front of the New York State Theatre, and then I made serenade, as if the two words rhyme. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think John Clifford also confirms that for the rest of his life, Balanchine always said serenade. Mm -hmm. And I think he really thought that it should be pronounced according to the language of the country, how you say the word serenade as in music. Uh, Because when he presented it in Latin America on tour in 1941, it was called serenata. And when he presented it at the Paris Opera in 1947, he called it serenade. Why do you think that the dancers uh, or the the balancing world, not including himself, um, <laughs> have chosen to to pronounce that? that? Do, do you think that they thought it was like a, a quirk of his accent? or like you know, <laughs> I would I guess that early on when his English wasn't too secure he began calling it serenade because he was more French than English in his language very often mm-hmm. and I would think um, Freddie Franklin and who was that long term ballet mistress she worked with him at the Ballet Russo Monte Carlo and then at City Ballet I'm sorry her name escapes me but she actually Unakai? No, older Una- than that Vida Brown mm-hmm. Mm. Vita Brown, there we go. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think they may have known him, say, Serenade, when he was more Russian and French than American. Mm. Maybe that's it, and they just kept it. I don't know. Very good. Well, we first recorded this episode in uh, 2017. Well, we're thinking that we recorded it maybe late 2016, published it early 2017. Um, so we just wanted to preface with that. But we, before we get into the actual history of Serenade, we want to talk about your personal history with the ballet. So tell us a little bit about that. Gosh, I was 20 when I first saw it, and I'd been looking, I suppose, at ballet and dance for about two years. I saw it at Covent Garden with the Royal Ballet, and I now realise I saw a surprisingly prestigious cast. The heroine was danced by Georgina Parkinson, who many Americans will remember as a remarkable ballet mistress for 30 or so years at American Ballet Theatre. The Russian dancer was Monica Mason, and she had always wanted to do the role the moment the Royal Ballet 
acquired it in 1964. She was a very strong technician and um, managed to get the role early on in the Royal Ballet's um, history with Serenade and went on doing it to about 1980, I think. Um, I can still see her execution of certain steps, really fabulous. Mm. And mm. the Dark Angel, curiously, was danced by Mel Park, who became a long-term um, director of the Royal Ballet School at the end of the last mm-hmm. century and a very important ballerina. I say surprisingly because usually the bla- the Dark Angel is associated with a woman with a wonderful arabesque and I wouldn't have said that Mel Park was the great arabesque kind. I later saw do, uh, her do the heroine which actually suited her a bit better. Hmm. Isn't that right. funny how just like one thing but you're right it's that's such a way that people cast is for that one moment in the promenade in Erebus but there's just so much more to it you know do you know there right? is an interview in the New York Public Library with the original Dark Angel I don't know if it was called the Dark Angel then but Catherine Maloney and one of the odd things about her is her name was spelt about 10 different w- ways in the various programs <laughs> which is Catherine with a C or a K um, whether there's an E in the middle there is and Maloney is spelt different ways anyway she chats in the New York Public library on tape her memory and she said it does need an arabesque mm-hmm. is, well i have a question about a different piece of casting that you saw is monica mason how tall is she well she was one of the taller royal ballet dancers but not as tall as her contemporary diane bergs my, my head says five foot six i'm not sure you know generally the royal ballet was a petite company Right. I I just I I imagine Monica to be taller. Maybe it's because of the context of the other dancers. But she was I, one of those I find dancers that who, she would have she if she danced beside particularly Rudolf Nureyev and maybe her frequent partner David Wall, she would be taller than them on point. Um, and they were such terrific men that they made it look heroic that they were dancing with this wonderful, powerful, tall woman. Right. I was just thinking that I I very much love a tall Russian girl, but it's not it, it's becoming less and less frequent. I feel. I mean, Colleen Neary obviously did it. Kira did that role. They were taller, but I feel like now we definitely see like more pint sized Russian girls. So yeah, you know, the Dark Angel casting might have, might seem strange to you, but to me, I'm already thinking like, oh, the Russian girl is like I, I love it when it's a tall woman. It's uh. It brings something different to it. I, I, I don't like getting boxed in in my serenade casting. <laughs> I, I think Balanchine, more than any important choreographer, avoids casting people according to genre. If he, he would take a role that had been associated with petite one, dancers and give them to tall dancers and vice versa. Um, it's it's. I, I've known people in New York who consider themselves Balanchine authorities. They, it should never be that type of dancer. And I think you haven't learned from Balanchine. He would cast against type. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, where we could we could just talk in circles about this. I could do a whole, like a whole podcast just about that. Now, now you're distracting me, Alistair. Can we have, can stay- we have a serenade <laughs> week? <please>? Yeah. <laughs> right. um, OK, so I, I guess I want to hear a little bit more then. So you, this is, you saw that's your your first experience with the ballet. I saw it twice with that cast in 1976. And I wish I had been living in London because I realized it was also danced that spring the, the heroine by Natalia Makarova and also by Len Simo, who I came to just adore so passionately. And she did do other Balanchine roles, but damn it, I missed her and Makarova. Oh, my God. She and Makarova in, in hugely that. admired each other and they were so unlike and they were great fans. I can't even imagine in Lynn Seymour and that would be, <laughs> that's like a, a bucket list, at like time machine <laughs> casting for me. She I would also, love to see. She also did... Um, Terpsichore and Calliope and Apollo, particularly I saw her, she was my first Terpsichore, and uh, and she told me that in Berlin she had danced um, Second Movement Symphony in C. Can you imagine? Wow. And she said, oh. I thought I was a musical dancer, and Balanchine really made me work on musicality, and because he absolutely wanted certain things to be on music. And the way she told it sounds odd, because I would say Lynn was a wonderful dancer for footwork. Um, but she said, for example, with the envoites at the end of um, Second Movement Symphony and C, uh, that Balanchine bullied her to be but 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 on the music. And he said, I don't care if you're on half point, um, but I need you to be on the beat. Oh. Um, I can't imagine Lynn needing to be on point. So that was the kind of step she could do easily. Mm-hmm. 
Right. Um, to continue the Royal Ballet, in late 1978, the Royal Ballet brought in Una Kai to rehearse, re-rehearse Serenade, and it was a really wonderful revival, and we had Robert Irving, the British conductor who'd been working for Balanchine for 10, 20 years, and it was his return to the Royal Ballet. He also conducted The Sleeping Beauty at that time, and he came back a few times after that, but that was his real return, and of course he made sure that Tempe was strict, mm. and it was just a great revival. What about um, your first time you saw New York City Ballet do it? Or some of the not, iconic cast? Not many did. months later. Um, and those days, I think, Kay Mezo was the heroine. And I believe the young Kira Nichols was w- at least one of the Russian dancers I saw. Um, I probably saw Maria Caligari as the Dark Angel, but I hadn't quite registered her then. And, of course, the shock was that the hair was loose. So this was a period when... Um, Balanchine wanted his company to dance it with loose hair, but he didn't yet require that anywhere else in the world. And as far as I know, he didn't make that a rule at all for any other company during his lifetime. That just became the international fashion and the national fashion after his death. Right. And some this people, including Francia Russell, who staged it often for Pacific Northwest Ballet, still prefer it with hair up. And I'm mm-hmm. on the whole, I'm with her. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't. I'm not oh, anti well, hair, but on the whole, I like it with hair up. I like the greater anonymity of when you can't easily identify which heroine is which. But I realize as I've gone on researching the ballet um, that Balanchine himself changed his mind about whether the women in Serenade are recognizable individuals. And there were times when he gave them quite different costumes, even within the three leading women of the elegy. Uh, or whether they are all dressed alike. I love the way it was between 1950 and 1976, when all the women, you you had to know which one was, Diane Adams or Tannikil, Leclerc or Patricia Wilde, because they all were dressed the same way with the same hairstyle. Right. And that's how it was with the Royal Ballet when I first saw it. Right. Uh, We've been identifying these um, three lead women by the names that we we all call them, you know, the, the Russian girl and the waltz girl and, the, you know, the dark angel. But the ballet did not initially start with these, I guess, characters and, um, you know, didn't even have the final movement, if I'm correct there. Let's just, let's talk about how the ballet evolved into the version that we see today. What, what did the, what was the first show of Serenade like? What who were their principles? What, what was the kind of, overall look of the ballet in 1934? Well, Balanchine was working with students, and that's why some of the Balanchine literature to this day says that the premiere was in 1935, um, because that was the first professional production. But in 1934, Balanchine staged it um, at White Plains um, as the debut of the um, School of American Ballet. Um, Actually, it wasn't the first performance. He had wanted it to be there, and it got rained off the first night. So the ballet that they did that first night, the only ballet for which the weather held out, was his Mozartiana, his 1933 Mozartiana, which, true to Balanchine form, he had been rejigging. He was crazy about a number of the young women in the company, one of whom was Holly Howard, his first American muse, and he had given her a solo that I think had completely changed from when he had made it for Tamara Tomanova a year before in uh, Europe. And he did say to Kirsten around this time, I think she's greater than Tamanova. Hmm. Anyway, that happened that first night. Then the next day, thank God, the weather worked and they were able to do the first performance of Serenade. We actually do have a few performances of it. There was no scenery and they were wearing pretty short tunics and we have the photographs taken from the audience. And um, I'm trying to remember the name of the woman who spent much of her life in Philadelphia and she passed these photographs on to a scholar, but she was a member of the very illustrious original cast. None of them knew they were illustrious then Mm -hmm. but it's amazing Mm -hmm. how many of them went on to have important careers and the one whose name i'm trying to remember actually became an uh, do i mean i've used joan mccracken and she became an important broadway star um and she sang as well as danced but she always valued valued her balanchine school of american back ballet background Mm. 
Um, anyway, I mean, the cast, of course, included Holly Howard, whom I've mentioned, but Bannon, she was also crazy about the original heroine of the Elegy, who was a woman called Heidi Vossela. Um, it had the very young Marie Jeanne, um, who was about maybe 14, 13 years old, um, who later became central to Balanchine's idea of serenade and other ballets. Mm-hmm. It was for her that he, more with her, that he made Concerto Barocco and Ballet Imperial and other works. Ruth Anna Boris, who later danced the Marie-Jeanne version of Serenade, um, and others too. So it's, it's lovely that these people who knew nothing that they were really going on, most of them to have important careers. Um, mm-hmm. One of them, Annabel Lyon, we'll talk about, and another one, Lida or Leda Antrutina, I think married Andrei Eglevsky and is mentioned in Balanchine's Will. Mm. What did the first professional production look like then? How many changes were made once we got a professional company? Well, as far as I know, um, the 1934 version textually was pretty much like the 1935 one, which was danced by the company called the American Ballet. And most of the dancers were the same. Um, by the time it became the American Ballet, they now had proper costumes, which were roughly knee length and patterned, not lower than the knee. Um, the women wore 30s hairstyles that ended above the shoulder, but seemed to be more or less loose. Um, maybe they wore braids that kept the hair in place so it didn't wave around too much. And something about braids across the hair, keeping the hair in place, became the main look of serenade for quite a few years. Mm. Uh of course, there we are. Or we've already started to talk about loose hair in Serenade. Balanchine began to experiment with that in the early 1940s. And some of the early film we have of Serenade is a silent film from 1944 of the Ballet Rista Monte Carlo. And you can see it's just excerpts from all four movements with Ruth Anna Boris doing the leading role. And she and the others are wearing these, their hair with these braids. But then suddenly in the, fir- in the final movement, um, the elegy, she and the dark angel of that time, who is Mary Ellen Moylan, um, have suddenly loosened their hair. So it is now flowing over their shoulders. Um, but it's not the way we have loose hair now because they sort of have um, permed frizzy hair uh, and it doesn't look as satisfying as the straight hair we now tend mm-hmm. to see. So curiously, this is filmed from a prompter's box in a Chicago theatre um, by Anne Barzell. And you can see Balanchine in the wings uh, and then she filmed something from the very next performance and guess what? They're now keeping their hair up. So Balanchine would obviously say, you're not a good idea, let's change mm. it. But it was in his mind and then 30 years later, 1976, he asks um, them to lower the hair. People tell it slightly differently, but I've probably he was rehearsing it for a week just the elegy with Karen von der Roldigen, who was his best friend on the company. Uh, and she had this beautiful dark blonde hair, very full. And he had already used it loose as the opening movement of Tchaikovsky Suite Number no. 3, with the whole core around her of other women with loose hair. And apparently her she f- fell to the floor at one elegy rehearsal, the hair came loose, and he said, oh, I love it. And he either that day or the next day got Maria Caligari as the dark angel and I think Colleen Neri uh, as the Russian dancer to loosen their hair. And then, of course, he realized three different hair colors, dark, bl- blonde, and red. And so he said, it's like a Clairol ad. Mm-hmm. And sometimes he also said it's like Charlie's Angels, which he often said was his favorite <laughs> program. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love the way that balance could just make light out of that. I'm sure Serenade had lots of dark and fateful significances actually for him, but but he he kept things light. He made rehearsals jolly. Mm-hmm. Well, let's not keep things light. Let's let's try. To, <laughs> let's explore. I, I'm I'm curious because obviously we you know you balance famously was um, not eager to give away his secrets of what maybe he thought some of the the. Uh, the, those kinds of elements of his works were, you know, it's he wouldn't sit there and tell you that this is a direct reference to, I don't know, some Greek myth or whatever. You know, he, he was mum on details like that, but doesn't mean that it never happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing that you sent that I, I don't remember you talking about last time was that in 1959, he had talk, told Bernard Taper 
that the LG shows how a man has his fate attached to his back. Can mm-hmm. we talk about that? Look at the Bernard Taper biography of Balanchine, and he is watching Serenade with Balanchine, I think in 1959, and Balanchine goes out for a drink with him afterwards and said, you know, that ballet is 25 years old. It's last year. That's not bad, 25 years. And then he says calmly, um, that final movement, it's like fate. A man goes through his life with a fate attached to his back. He meets a girl. He cares for her. But his fate has other plans for him. And he has to move on. And, of course, he's referring to the dark angel blinding the man as she leads him on stage, then allow him to see this girl he cares for. And he has this loving relationship with her, but it's also a, a, a conflict because he's torn by both women and finally the Dark Angel leads him on. And this is, Balanchine would sometimes talk about the story of Serenade to a number of people, but normally he kept it light. This is the only one where Balanchine seems to be talking from the gut. And Bernard Taper said, this is fascinating. Do you ever tell this to the dancers? And Balanchine said, heaven forbid. Ah. (laughs) Um, So I think he is thinking in terms of a ballet about fate. Now, the image of a man being blinded connects it to the legend of Orpheus, which Balanchine told and told and retold throughout his career. You know, the Stravinsky Orpheus that he made in 1948. Um, Chacon is all Orpheus music. He had staged the complete Gluck Orpheus for the Metropolitan Opera in 1936. I could go on with other Orpheus things. It's crazy. He was thinking of Orpheus around the 1930s. It's in Lincoln Kirstein's diaries. And I think when he has the man coming on blinded by the dark angel at the beginning of the elegy and serenade, Orpheus is again in his mind. He's not telling the literal story of Orpheus. I think he's just giving us a refraction of the Orpheus myth. Suddenly there is the man who's blinded, doesn't know where he is going. His fate allows him to see this woman. He dances It's a sort of long moment out of time with this woman he loves. Mm. The reference really is to Orpheus, who has lost his wife. Um, He is the poet. He is the singer. He's the musician. He regains his wife, but then his fate has other plans for him. It's actually to do with Greek mythology. He makes the mistake of looking at her in the Greek myth. Mm -hmm. Um, Balanchine doesn't tell us quite that bit in Serenade, but obviously sight and then blindedness, again, are important parts of the elegy. Mm -hmm. Now, I now think that Balanchine was thinking of Orpheus throughout Serenade, and that this makes sense of some of the famous accidents that happened during the 1934 rehearsals. Maybe this is me being fanciful, maybe this is me being pretentious, but we all know the Balanchine choreographed in this ballet in a way that he seems never really to have done before or afterwards. Um, A girl turned up late and Balanchine said, let's keep that. Actually, he didn't quite that. He just later on said, oh, a girl arrived late. Let's work that in. And he he didn't do it to this bit of music they'd been rehearsing at the time. He found the right bit of music and the right bit of choreography. Mm -hmm. Um, A girl fell over. I think that's this is the most significant moment of all, by the way. Uh, and Balanchine said, oh, we'll keep that in. Um, or he put it back in later on. Actually, when you look at the way those things happen in the choreography, they are um, at two of the most choreographed moments in the whole ballet. When the woman falls over in the middle of the sonatina, it's not the later fall that we see, it's the first right. fall. Um, often danced today by the Russian dancer, um, wasn't in those days. Um, the quarter ballet of 15 come in and in rows of three deep and they take the shape of a Greek theatre in a semicircle behind her. It's an extraordinary piece of choreography there. Mm-hmm. And they just stand or kneel there and do port de bras exercises. It's the most choreographed moment in a way we've seen so far while she is there lying in this strange position on the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you know, uh, when we first did this uh, talk, however many years ago, I had just done a presentation on Serenade in the New York Public Library. The reason why I wanted to do this presentation and indeed have a seminar is that I had just found film of the 1940 film of the Valley Rooster Monte Carlo, Silent Points, another Chicago performance. And when the girl falls down at that moment in the sonatina, she falls 
lies on her back as if she is a corpse with her arms folded across her chest. And the New York Public Library also found lots of old photographs. And one of them, she's lying there, um, I think, with her arms stiff by her side. Hmm. It's not just lying on her side in the more accidental way we now see. And the formation around her of 15 girls is very close. It's as if they're absolutely close, you know, eavesdropping on this intimate moment. Hmm. Balanchine really meant, well, possibly death at this girl, that they, a girl falls over and dies. What is he thinking of? I think he's thinking of Orpheus's wife, Eurydice, who was hmm. truly playing with her girlfriends when suddenly a snake bit her and she fell over and died. By the time Orpheus reached her, she was dead. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Balanchine, of course, would never tell the story of, of Eurydice to the dancers right, by right. anybody else, hmm. but I think that's what's happening there. As for when the girl arrives late, which happens at the end of the sonatina first movement. Um, I've, he's already shown us these 17 dancers at the beginning of Serenade. Now he gives us that image of them all again. And I think he's, I think the whole of the sonatina is introducing us, and I'm sounding very fanciful here, forgive me, to the world of women as the world of the dead. Uh, and I think that's what we see at the beginning of Serenade, that these women are holding out this fateful gesture and gradually in that wonderful ritual that we all know at the beginning of Serenade, the nine-point ritual that begins with the gesture and ends with turnout that get, takes us from first position to tendu side to fifth position, that they are going through a transformation of the self that is like what happens with death if you believe in another world, which, of course, Manenstein certainly did. The real world is not here. So I think we see at the end, when the girl arrives late, Eurydice entering the world of the dead. And you can see her sort of thinking, oh, where's my place? And she makes a place which, oddly enough, is sent to stage. When you're talking about World of the Dead, it's making me think of Giselle. And one of the notes that we passed back and forth was talking about some of the echoes of other ballets within Serenade, one of which you mentioned is Giselle. Can we talk about some of those that you have observed? Yes. I mean, it's odd because Balanchine probably had mixed feelings on Giselle. I think he actually liked it, but he hated what Giselle did to dancers. He would talk about Giselle Lightus and Alicia Markova, who had interested him so much early on, um, became the most precious contrived Giselle later on and would monkey with Tempe, which Balanchine hated. He had admired Olga Spesivtseva as Giselle, and he later actually staged Giselle with Tamara Tumanova in Paris. Um, and Maria Torchief once told Darling Croce that it was extraordinary to watch these rehearsals because there was Tamanova, a fairly mannered dancer usually, but Balanchine had always been wild about her. She was simply a very beautiful woman. And Torchief said in about 1980, you know, it was so fantastic to watch these rehearsals because Balanchine worked and worked Tamanova and you saw a whole new Tamanova and you saw a whole new Giselle and it was so exciting. And then it came to the performance and Tamanova dropped everything that Balanchine had taught her and did the same uh -huh. performance that she'd done before. And Balanchine was even crazier about that than he had been about the one he taught her. And taught you said, darling, Kretsche. he was in love with her. He's still in love with her. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's Balanchine. Oh, right. he, was, he wasn't going to criticise a woman when she'd done the performance. You know, he'd just be supportive. Hmm. Um, anyway, so I think he was interested in Giselle in the right context. He had actually also supervised, I think in 1946, briefly, the American Ballet Theatre production, and he had taken pains to um, bring the old ending of Giselle, where Giselle disappears, not behind her grave into the cross, but into a, a grassy knoll into the ground in the middle of the stage. Mm. That, that mattered to him. Um, I've seen that Giselle in two or three productions, but most Giselles don't quite end that way. She doesn't go back to the cross. She goes into another part of the of the ground. Mm. Wow. That's very interesting. Odd to think that Balanchine uh, cared about a detail like that, isn't it? But right. He did. But it also makes sense. <laughs> well, well, I think when you think about when you're talking about Balanchine being someone who does believe in another world, I, it, it makes sense that that would be important to him because it's like he, mm -hmm. he doesn't want he wouldn't have wanted that the protagonist to end up back in the same place like that that that's the way that the story arc needs to yeah. finish. and he just gives us little refracted echoes of Giselle in Serenade. the The most striking one is that 
diagonal of women that where they peel off into the wings, mm-hmm. um, right. like the will is Giselle. Um, sometimes the way that at the end of the Russian dance, the heroine falls over with her hair now loose can remind us of Giselle at the beginning of the mad scene. And sometimes the way that she, in the elegy, goes to this strange woman who has just come out of the wings at yeah, the corner, back downstage, left. Um, she's often known as the mother in um, Balanchine circles. Mm-hmm. We members of the audience don't normally know that she is called the mother. I discovered this only when I had a, ban- a, a serenade symposium. I loved it. Yeah. And, when, and one of the women we had from City Ballet was um, Gwyneth Muller, who said, I'm the mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a very like nice moment for, yeah. you know, the other thing I'm thinking about when we're talking about um, things that happened in rehearsal and then, then were brought into the ballet, some things that some audience members not, might not realize is just little instances where there are less dancers on stage, right? Sometimes there's just a couple dancers that are off. Sometimes there's just one dancer that's off for different moments. And what do we know about that? Was that also just a necessity from who was in rehearsal at the time, you know, rehearsing with students? Do we know anything about that? Or maybe it's not even that important. Balanchine said that at one point there were six women and another point there were nine women. And I just choreographed that. I reckon he moved those bits around cleverly. And there are times when you see six meeting nine too. Uh, and because Balanchine is such a genius of arithmetic, he can make these numbers matter to you. And you almost begin to wonder if there isn't a, 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 a mysterious mathematical significance mm. to them. Um, we, we've, we've opened up so many subjects, and I'm sure I'm going to jump into something that we you wanted me to talk about ten minutes down the line. But let's That's talk about totally the fine. Let's talk about the Fouetti terms. Oh yes, the yeah. weirdest thing of all in researching serenade, and I'd known this. For, ages, back in the 80s when I first started to give any lecture or presentation in England about Serenade, I found Lincoln Kirstein's 1939 Ballet Alphabet, and under F for Fouette, he describes the Fouette very clearly, Fouette turn, that is, and he talks about how Pierina Legnani amazed the Russians in St. Petersburg in 1895, 1893 actually, with her first lot of 32 Fouette turns. Then he says how the Fouette turn became a standard enough steps so that Balanchine could have two of his baby ballerinas doing fouettes at the same time in, I think, 1932 or 1933. And then Kirsten says casually, in Serenade 1934, Balanchine had 16 women doing 32 fouettes <laughs> perfectly. And you read that and you think, Lincoln, Kirsten, are you off your meds? <laughs> this, this, this can't be true. And I remember reading this bit to the Serenade Symposium that we gathered, which had a lot of very distinguished Balanchine dancers and scholars and musicologists and so forth in 2015. And everybody just said, oh, this is Lincoln being mad and dismissed it. And they would all start to tell you stories of Lincoln's madder behavior. And then a few months later, I was going through Robert Gottlieb's anthology, um, Reading Dance, and he has an account of working with Balanchine by um, Annabelle Lyon. And she says Balanchine had this company or school of women who could all do things, but he got them all doing fouettes. I was the one, the guy was trained by Fokine, I had other strengths, but I couldn't do fouettes. So Balanchine sent me off stage just before that bit. And That's the why others- there's one less girl, right? And she and she adds <laughs> that's why that, that they, they they later to PK turns. So it's at that very moment that we now see with PKs going in a circle. Mm-hmm. I still cannot imagine how you can get sixteen girls to do thirty two fuetes. I I wonder if this isn't an exaggeration if he didn't have them in pairs doing. Um, there's you know there's a bit in Raymond of variations where women do fuete turns at the same time in opposite directions. Maybe he had a couple and then a couple and then a couple you can keep it going if they're only doing four or eight turns at a time Mm -hmm. right well the other thing i'm thinking is that i think it's i'm trying to remember now it's like either 14 or 16 pk turns so the music only allots for that much so maybe it was (laughs) fuetes but it was like a hair less maybe than 32 just just talking about lincoln and you know having to kind of sift through what's real or not just with through that one person's perspective and account of history um 
that's just one example. But uh, uh, you know, let's let's take something like the hair down, right? So that's fairly that's more recent history than you know the creation of Serenade. That's 1976. You might think it's like you know not too difficult to get all those people, especially once you're you know putting together. Um, uh, your serenade research, you know, th- th- which you've been doing for at this point many years. So all those people are still alive, minus balancing. Um, you can easily contact them, but it's not the same account. Yeah, how do you sift through that? How do you get to a historical truth, whatever that is? <laughs> <laughs> well, you just keep on asking people, and as I think I said to you seven or how many years ago, when you're the chief critic of the New York Times, people will answer your emails, which is a bad <laughs> If you are a PhD from New Mexico, they might ignore you. But I was very lucky those days. So many people in the dance world would reply. Uh, and of course, a few more people were alive then. So I, for example, was in email contact with somebody who couldn't come to the symposium, but I had read in you as a wonderful woman. She is now dead. And that is the first Pat McBride um, who became Pat, uh, Lady Lusada, Pat McBride Lusada. Wonderful woman. She was a founder member of New York City Ballet, a close friend of Tanakil Leclerc for, throughout her life. I think she died around 2018, 2019. But when I was doing serenade research around 2016, I wrote to her and she was the original Dark Angel in 1948 for New York City Ballet. Wow. When when they were doing short tunics and she said I can send you to the photographs of the dresses we wore then Uh, and curiously I've interviewed people this is interesting about memory there are people who are in that cast in 1948 who swore they wore Karinska frocks down past the knee and they absolutely didn't Um, the Karinska (laughs) frocks didn't come in until 1952 there was an interim version in 1950, but in 1948, they wore tunics that ended, or very short dresses that ended just beneath the hip. And she sent me to the big coffee table edition of New York City Ballet by Lincoln Kirstein that has remarkable photographs in it. And she said, you'll find there are three photographs with Melissa Hayden as the heroine, the waltz dancer, me as the dark angel. And is it Frank Oman? I forget the man in the elegy. Hmm. If you're in the Southern California area this June, join Golden State Ballet as they present From New York with Love, an evening featuring world premieres by Gabriel Lamb and Norbert de la Cruz III, as well as the kaleidoscopic, heart-pumping work Increases by Tony Award winner Justin Peck. You won't want to miss out on a chance to experience California's newest ballet company in three world-class ballets. Performances are this June 6th at the Barclay Center in Irvine, California, and June 9th and 10th at the Poway Center for the Performing Arts. Tickets are available at goldenstateballet.org. So when you did the symposium, were you kind of crowdsourcing a little bit with everyone, talking with them, exchanging memories? How how did that... (laughs) work um, well for uh, uh, actually i'd better clinch the hair thing because michael's going to lose sleep if i don't tell oh. the story. <laughs> uh, sorry yeah, everybody we'll in new york associates that with allegra kent because balanchine gave her the first new york performance of a revised version in which at the end of the elegy she loosened her hair and because Allegra Kent who was very much loved and a very great ballerina but by that point she had acquired a reputation for eccentricity shall we say and gave remarkably few performances per season there she was doing serenade a big event the house is full of people who knew who Allegra Kent was and suddenly she loosened her hair as she fell at the end of the third movement and did the whole of the elegy with loose hair well I know two people who there and then said Allegra has gone mad in in full view of the audience. This is it. Um, <laughs> David Vaughan, who adored Allegra Kent, um, <laughs> just said, Riley, in Allegra's presence at our symposium in 2015, I was expecting Giselle's mother to come in. And, <laughs> and Allegra, of course, just roared with laughter and loved right. she loves her own reputation for eccentricity. But she was also very practical about it. She said it needs, uh, it should be done very, very simply. I'm lucky I have light hair, so it's very simple for me to loosen my hair in one stroke. That's the important thing. 
Mm-hmm. And of course, now it has become more elaborate because people have started to wear much longer hair and they have to have their hair coiffed before the performance. And that is so elaborate. But I, and that's particularly in New York City Ballet. But I think Balanchine wanted it as simple as Allegra made it. He, he first did it with Carnival Rodigan in rehearsal in 1976. As I said, the Charlie's Angels Claire Roll story. Mm-hmm. And I forget, I think I had, to, I couldn't get in touch with. Karen, though she did come to the presentation I gave with Robert Reskovic at the library and, and, and was very thrilled to see it. But uh, I think I really established the story from Maria Caligari and Colleen Neary. Mm. Why do you think Serena resonates with audiences to, to this day? Why, why? I mean, so many ballets from that time especially one that I guess underwent so many revisions, you know, it could have just easily been left to the wayside. Um, obviously, Balanchine cared enough to continue to revise it, but, you know, it's it's impacted audiences and dancers so deeply. And I just, I'd like to hear a little bit about why you think that is. Well, my guess is that it's what hit me when I first saw it. I I was new to dance. I'd just been watching two years and I'd understood that there were wonderful ballets that were plotless and that there were wonderful ballets that were narrative. And I was happy to watch both. And suddenly I was watching what I thought was a plotless ballet that turned out in the elegy to have a narrative. And there was no doubt that my heart was in my mouth as I was watching what was happening to the heroine. And I don't think you can watch the elegy without having ideas of death and love and transcendence. And when she is carried away at the end, you're going somewhere with her. You see, or you certainly are watching her being carried into the beyond. Um, whether you think it is the world after death or or just transcendence, that's your own interpretation, but it certainly is a different kind of being, I believe. Um, I think the allergy takes you through a great many kind of feelings. And then when you know Serenade, you see that some of these things have been there all along. And I now find what I'm most crazy about with Serenade is that it is the echo chamber ballet, that it is full of things that are happening for the second time. Um, and Balanchine probably had a bit of this in 1934, but I think he began to develop it as he reworked the ballet during the 30s and in 1940. Uh, he had now worked with Rogers and Hart, and I can't help but think he must. He was great friends, particularly with Lawrence Hart, the lyricist. And I think he'd worked in Babes in Arms in 1937, their musical, which began with a song. Um, and so it seems that we have met before and laughed before, but who knows where and when. Some things that happened for the first time seem to be happening again. And I think Balanchine must have thought, hmm, that's my life. I've been in Europe, now I'm in America. I've loved woman, woman, now I'm loved in love with another and sometimes I'm meeting the first woman again by the way Tamara Jeva his first wife he'd married, married in Russia they'd come to the west together she'd moved to America apart from him now he meets up with her in 1935 and she is part of his first season of the American Ballet so there are echoes throughout his life mm. uh, of the woman he had lost the one he regained uh, uh, and the heart moving on yeah. you know? mm-hmm. I I, I, the way he has, for example, five women making a line in the middle of the sonatina, and you see them traveling along, um, often the horizontal line. In the original waltz, it began with five women, another line of five women. That's now changed, but of course, we now have the Russian dance, which he added in 1940, and that has five women at the beginning. So I think Balanchine, that's just an echo. I don't know that it had a meaning for him, but it's certainly just full of things we think. Didn't I see this before? Mm-hmm. And like the mother who comes on at the end of the elegy, we've seen a mother earlier on in the sonatina. And um, we kind of, mm-hmm. have we seen this before? Is it the same dancer? And I know when I watch it to this day, I try to work out if it is the same dancer. It isn't actually, but it's a puzzle mm-hmm. and fun. Yeah. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm wondering, we've talked about so many changes that have happened over the years. Can we talk about any changes that happened to the music? Oh, good question. Um, first of all, we should say that Balanchine was staging a score that he knew as a ballet score. Um, when he was in Russia, um, Fokin 
choreographed this in 1915. We don't know if Balanchine saw the original, but certainly he saw the 1923 revival when Fokin had moved to the West. And some of Balanchine's best friends, like Lydia Ivanova, uh, were in this 1923 revival. And Fokin's ballet, to the first three movements of the Serenade for Strings, is called Eros, Eros or Eros, the God of Love. Um, and it had an angel in it. It had the idea of love and death. And there's, in I think the last movement, the idea of a woman on the floor kind of doing a gesture as if to say, was this a dream? Now, all of these are things, of course, that happen in Serenade. I do not know if they happened at the same moment in the music, um, but I think all of that is going around in Balanchine's mind. Maybe he was just thinking, oh, Fokin doesn't know how to choreograph, I could do this better, and did do it better. <laughs> but he did it uh -huh. to the same three movements, the first three movements of the music. Uh, for whatever reason, Fokin never choreographed the Russian dance, the Tema Russo, the final movement of the music. Now, Tchaikovsky knew what he was doing. He knew that the fourth movement is how the music should end. And he's making a statement about not just music, but about Russian music. He was very proud that he was the first internationally successful Russian composer, and he often conducted Serenade for Strings when he conducted abroad. Uh, so he loved the idea that he had composed a Serenade for Strings that ended with a Russian theme, a Russian dance. Balanchine ignores all that. When he adds it, he thinks I've got to end with the elegy because that's, I presume he was very proud of that ending. It is such a moving, wonderful ending. He saw how he could sneak in the Tema Russo Russian dance as the third of the four movements instead of the fourth. Mm. Um, brilliantly done. It's at that moment, I think, that he sees that what has been three separate movements, and I think his stage serenade, the program suggests, as three different scenes, three different almost stories, should we say. Uh, now he can see how to work it into one continuity. Mm -hmm. um, and he does it for this wonderful, still young dancer, Marie Jeanne, for whom he makes Barocco and Berlin Imperial. And for her, he collides the roles of the Russian dancer and the waltz dancer so that all the solo opportunities we associate with those two women now were done by Marie Jeanne. Mm -hmm. And they were then done um, by the ballerista Monte Carlo ballerina Natalie Krasovska. And we have silent film of her in all four movements doing them. And then done by Ruth Anna Boris. And we have film of her doing it in 1944 with a ballerista Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. And then Balanchine rethinks the ballet and thinks, mm, let's go back to having it, sharing these roles among a greater number of dancers. And he went on fiddling, really, uh, with this throughout the 50s. Um, maybe around 1960, he finished, he, he settled on more or less the version that we now know with three main women doing the three main roles. Um, but even after that, he would occasionally change. If you look, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that it took me years before I spotted this. Uh, at the 1973 K. Mezo New York City Ballet film, I think it's a wonderful film in color of Serenade. Um, there are four leading dancers, not three. I'd always lazily looked and thought it's K. Mezo as the heroine, it's Karen Wanda Roligan as the Dark Angel, and it is Sarah Leland as the Russian dance. Actually, there's one movement in which it isn't Sarah Leland. I believe it is Susan right. Henn. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, just think when you were talking about the Russian movement being added, well, for one, I can't imagine how hard the ballet would be oh my for God. that woman. Because Rus Russian girl is already, as it stands today, already a famously difficult role um, for that principal dancer. But I'm wondering if we know anything about how the transition would work from the waltz to the elegy. Because right now you have um, the waltz ends and full company on stage and it kind of dissipates until finally they're only left the five women but that obviously is not how the elegy starts the elegy starts with the waltz heroine having fallen to the floor mm -hmm. i think it was a separate scene uh i think no man came on at the end of the sonatina mm -hmm. i don't quite know how it did end but perhaps just with eurydice shall we say entering the world of the dead and maybe it just mm -hmm. did that without a man ending i don't know but I somehow suspect that the waltz began with, well, I, we, I think we have some account that it began with five women. And then it ended, I think, with five women, which would be a very neat 
Parallel yeah. again. Parallel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's then the blackout. I think the blackout is probably between each of the movements. And then suddenly the lights go up on a woman lying there as if in grief or as if dead on the floor. And then we go into the elegy. Mm. And if you think of the structure of suite number three, Tchaikovsky suite number three, we have three different scenes. I think that's how Serenade probably was. Mm, I'd been looking at casts for the original 1930s programs for ages before I realized what they were telling me, that Balanchine gives you first movement is danced by these women and names them all. Second movement is danced by these women, and it's not all the same. And the third movement, he introduces two women who haven't been in the first two movements, and that's Heidi Vossler and Catherine Maloney. And they're just there because they are the heroine of the elegy and the dark angel. And the man, of course, is only there in that version. He was Charles Lasky. And I think at the very premiere in 1934, there were just four men. He didn't bring in four extra men. I think Charles Lasky doubled and went into that partnering exercise bit. Mm. Right. Uh, and it's only 1935 that Balanchine actually has five men and can refigure that in the way we now know it. Mm-hmm. I, I have one other question about the music that you put in our notes, and I want to make sure that we talk about <laughs> it really quickly, that you mentioned that there was maybe a repeat in the music that Balanchine added that Tchaikovsky didn't originally have. Well, I wish I could check this out. I I had a really, um, I don't know if you saw the New York Times, I was able to interview um, Andrew Litton, the conductor for New York City Ballet. And it's so interesting talking to a musician who knows Tchaikovsky and knew Balanchine but had not conducted the ballet repertory. So he comes really, I suppose, in his 50s originally to New York City Ballet as an outsider. Uh, and he loves what he's conducting, but he can absolutely talk, shall we say, skeptically about some of this. And he pointed out there was a repeat in the waltz that he said there's no indication Tchaikovsky ever wanted this repeat, but it's always done at New York City Ballet. And he said, and it's fine. It really is satisfying. It's not, doesn't, it doesn't musically trash anything. Right. Um, right. But that seems to be instilled by Balanchine. Um, I'm sure Balanchine always had a problem from 1940 onwards of how do you connect the sonatina into the waltz right. because the sonatina ends beautifully and then suddenly it has this very loud marcato chord. Um, mm. And Balanchi was always re-choreographing that. If you look at films, just the position in which the, we see the heroine in the man's arms changed from 1973 to later on and blah, blah, blah. Um, if you watch it in the 1957 film with Diane Adams, you don't hear that loud chord. Uh, Balanchine fades the music away, so you just hear it all in a diminuendo, and she virtually ends the movement in a, in near silence. And mm. Andrew Litton said, I've always found the connection of the, the, should we say, the drama of the sonatina jarring as an introduction to the, dra- the, 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 the drama of the waltz. And suddenly this Diana Adams 1957 Montreal film works so much better, so I brought in this revised version of the score in 2019. But I think other Balanchine authorities said, no, we, are, we believe we should keep the final version of Serenade that Balanchine mm-hmm. approved in his lifetime. But it is true, Balanchine, that's one of the moments that Balanchine went on reworking again and again. Arlene Kripche told me the story that she went to Saratoga around 1972, 71, I forget when, and Balanchine's fame, fiddling with the ending of the sonatina and Melissa Hayden, who'd been dancing mm-hmm. it for over 20 years, she said, who would have thought it is still working out how to choreograph this movie? <laughs> Funny. <laughs> uh-huh. I love it. Um, so that's one of the things. I think he... When he added the Russian dance, he didn't add the entire Russian dance. He added, he, he took a cut within it, and he did the cut version of the Russian dance for about 26 years. And around 1966, uh, he opens the cut. And if you look at the Diane Adams 1957 Montreal film, which is on DVD, you'll see the old version of the choreography. And it has one or two things that one or two people still miss, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but that had to go as Balanchine worked out the new version. Um, and of course, as I've said, it's he, he did change the score radically by moving that final movement into the penultimate movement. And that makes you wonder a lot about Balanchine 
the supposed master musician. I mean, he, he's, of course, so musically satisfying in so many ways and would often say to his dancers, I have to get my Tchaikovsky ballets into a state where I can meet Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky with a clean conscience when I meet him in the next life. Uh, as he would with all these composers, he would talk this way. They were going to be his friends. He almost had a hotline. <laughs> he felt. Tchaikovsky told me to do this, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, actually, I think Tchaikovsky would have met him and said, I've got a bone to pick with you. I do not want. <laughs> when you think about it, he moves Tchaikovsky's music around in four ballets, important ballets. He does it in the Nutcracker, where he brings in something from Sleeping Beauty. He misses out the Prince's right. variation and he moves the Sugar Plum variation. He uses mm -hmm. a text of Ballet Imperial, Piano Concerto Number no. 2, that we know that Tchaikovsky disapproved of. It was done by his student, Silati. <laughs> Tchaikovsky did not like that version of his score. Um, Balanchine stuck to it. <laughs> he took Tchaikovsky for the Symphony Number no. 3, Diamonds, did the very unusual format of making a symphony with five movements. Uh, Balanchine lops off the first movement and makes it a much more conventional four-movement structure. I don't think Piotr Ilyich would have been very pleased with this. <laughs> and Mazzatiani, he would have it too. Um, curiously, he made two bigger changes to, or big changes anyway, to Stravinsky scores after, after Stravinsky died. Um, of course, you know that he lopped off the beginning of Apollo. He took away the prologue. Mm -hmm people still argue about hugely, rightly. Um, what very few people have spotted is that he jigged around the divertimento from Basie de la Faye. And when he just did the, the divertissement in 1972, Patricia McBride and Helgi Thomasson, um, that wonderful, great variation of the Helgi Thomasson isn't part of the divertimento. Balanchine had taken that in from elsewhere, it's gypsy music from elsewhere in the ballet. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is so dramatic and so beautiful, because Balanchine is actually, he's not doing a divertimento, he's doing a drama from Basie de la Fe. And because it's already <laughs> going on that on in that amazing male variation, which, by the way, Peter Martins himself said that is the greatest single variation Balanchine ever made for a man. And you can see with that going on in the ballet, why Balanchine then adds in 1974 that a staggering ending to the divertimento from Basie de la Fe, um, which again takes us deep into the drama of that ballet. Mm -hmm. So divertimento is the wrong word. It's a great ballet, but he should be calling it, some, as I say, drama from Basie de la Fe. <laughs> it's just interesting thinking about these changes that, we know from all of these famous ballets, right? We're talking about Apollo, the birth scene going away. We're talking about these changes to Serenade. One thing, you know, we just saw um, Square Dance in Miami City Ballet and they had a collar and that was something that was taken away at some point. And so I just like, of course, there have to be these rules for the trust where it's like we want to abide by the last version of what was there. But I just, I find it interesting to hear that there are these other versions that are worth experiencing or worth knowing about as mm -hmm. as well. I don't know if there's a question there. It just made me think of it. No, it's a very good point. I've, I mean, I, I hope we should do it like Shakespeare, where all these versions are known and companies can choose which version they stage. I think there are a few where people should get their Balanchine version right. What we now see in Liebeslied of Alza, which for many people is one of the top two or three greatest, most adult, most poignant of all Balanchine ballets, uh, isn't quite what Balanchine gave us. The choreography is there, but Balanchine made the the second half of Liebeslied of Alza, he not only made the room transparent, he had stars in the sky at the mm. background. So we're really seeing a special kind of transcendence. And it's not the same as you see it now at New York City Ballet. Wonderful. Mm. I and mean, I've seen it with great cast, but when you see it with stars, which is how I first saw it at the Royal Ballet, you, again, you know, you're, it's like what I was saying about the elegy and serenade, you're moving through into another realm. Mm -hmm. Right. Almost every, so many Balanchine ballets are to do with a journey from one world into another. That's really what the ending of Apollo is about. It's sort of implicit even in the final image, I think, of Prodigal Son. But when you think of the end of Serenade, if you think of the end of La Sonambula, 
um, you know, the old La Sonambula, you very much saw the light taking off, not just into the upper chamber, the sleepwalker's light, but it then went off up into the sky. My right. friend John Brown, who was in the original cast, all she remembers about the ending is that she had a crick in her neck because you, you as a spectator, <laughs> stood looking at this light going up and up and up when you were on stage. You know? uh, oh, that's funny. I loved that moment. That was such a beautiful thing. In that oh, ballet, think of the end of the Nutcracker. Experience. You know how amazing that those children are taking off into the sky. We mm-hmm. don't quite know where. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe for our last question or thought we could just i I just want to hear serenade is approaching its 90th and anniversary next year um and i just want to hear where where, where you think serenade sits in in the history of ballet in the pantheon of ballet what what what, (laughs) well i'm on record i'm on record as calling it the most rewatchable of all ballets I have no hesitation about that. That doesn't mean I quite call it the greatest. How do you choose the greatest Balanchine Ballet? But but Serenade is certainly up there. It is so important as an open sesame to the world of Balanchine. I think it is also so fascinating that it both gives us plotless dancing and plotful dancing. We keep Mm -hmm. on seeing meanings, uh, uh, and then we're just... Uh, see dancing, movement, running, tearing us away into just the joy of movement or the pleasure, the rapture of movement. Mm. Um, it's, I mean, I don't want this to be the final question because there's still so much to talk about. And certainly, <laughs> um, For one thing, I think we know that Balanchine was rude about Isadora Duncan, but I think the idea of Isadora Duncan, who greatly inspired Fokine, uh, is there in Serenade, just the way that women walked and ran. That's what Isadora is about. Fokin just said, Isadora taught us that ballet doesn't have to be about virtuosity. Ballet can just be the most simple movement, but taking off to the music and becoming poetry. Mm-hmm. I think right. that's where uh, every dancer who's ever been in Serenade just thinks of that joy of just running, running, running across the stage, running as you don't in almost any other ballet. Um one of the revelations, in it, but it's not a revelation, it makes total sense, is something Kira Nichols said at the symposium in 2015. You know, there's amazing jumps in the Russian dance. And that is not the virtuoso jump that probably was originally a ballonné battu. But later on, she, the leading dancer, and the four demis cross the stage with this concave shape where the leg... It aims forward and the arms and the torso bend forward mm-hmm. and then they bend backwards. You know, called you know, the so flies. Bend. We call it the flies. Ah, the concave jump, convex jump, alternating. Mm-hmm. Um, Kieran Nichols mm-hmm. said Balanchine wanted a modern dance quality to those mm-hmm. jumps. Oh, and it made complete sense the moment she said it. And by the way, I should right. add that the moment Kieran Nichols made her debut in that, which I think is 1980. I might be a year out. Kira Arlene Croce, the great critic, once said that those jumps have never been danced better. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. It is kind of, I mean, it's something we would never do otherwise, I think, that, right. that mm-hmm. step now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, there's also, again, Arlene Croce pointed out there's a moment that comes out of Jesse Matthews. Now, you Americans may not know who Jesse Matthews was, but go and watch her 1934 film, Evergreen. And it's an adaptation of something she had danced in 1930 on the London stage. Balanchine had seen her. Balanchine had even been, I think, in a Cochrane review with Jesse Matthews. Um, she was probably one of these charming dancers who had about six steps, you know, and she did them to death. And there's one account. <laughs> I'm guessing that from something in the, in that book, I remember Balanchine, where I think Balanchine's wardrobe master says how he and Balanchine used to laugh about Jesse Matthews. But one of the charming steps, and uh, Jesse Matthews in this film, Evergreen, is adorable. And one of her things is throwing up a leg, and then she pushes the air forwards while she's doing a massive backbend. And that mm. is called a Jesse Matthews backbend and balancing it's the whole core doing it at the end of the wall. So they go mm-hmm. push, push as they arch backwards. Uh, it's a fabulous gesture. And I think, I don't think there's any film where they do it quite ideally, but people remember that in the 1960s, that really was a very rapturous, thrilling moment. Mm, I love um, that. And there was another echo, I think, is from Nijinska. You know, one of the most 
amazing formations in the whole serenade. You hardly notice it. It's in the sonatina. Uh, and it's when I think, is it the Russian dancer or the dark angel comes on for the first solo? And you, there's formation up in the upstage left corner where Balanchine gets them in four rows, the women, and they all go into rows of backbends. So they're looking away from the audience. And it's a, it happens so suddenly. If you look closely, I think this is an Ajinska. Uh, formation because he balanced well, Nijinska staged something very similar for four rows of men in Les Nos. Oh, uh, right. uh, but of course, when you watch it in Les Nos, it has this monumental, powerful, dark effect. Suddenly, there it is, almost out of sight in the corner of the stage in Serenade. Okay. But it's a Nijinska formation. And it's, it's not out of I sight for that girl that's doing the deepest backbend <laughs> for so long. I always, oh, that's. The worst spot to have. <laughs> it's, it's fabulous. It's like, you know, it's, it's Serenade is so full of wonderful choreographic details that are just there and, and you can miss them, but they are there for you to watch and the, your hundredth time of seeing the ballet. Sometimes you notice them for the first time. Wonderful. It's it's so true. The ballet is very rewatchable. <laughs> now, now I just I just have to go watch it. I I need to see it. I, it's not it's not going this season, but I think it's going in the fall. And you know, our favorite dancer. I mean, I don't well, I don't like to play favorites, but you know, we we may as well just be real here. Mira Nadon did the waltz girl in Spain, so I just I I need to see her in that role so <laughs> yeah that's wonderful change. there is one change at city ballet where serenade has changed for the worst since balanchine's death or just since even peter martin's departure which is the costume man mark happel the problem with those Karinska dresses is that they tear. I'm sure any yes. who have done serenade will know that there's always fabric that comes off and this goes back to 1950 but guess what put up with it uh <laughs> Instead, Mark Happel tried in around 2019, 2018, uh, making a rather stiffer kind of fabric. Mm. And it also meant there's almost invisible cream panels at the front of the dresses became almost a bright yellow lemon color, which is wrong. Mm -hmm. And yeah. originally, the dresses were too long. So it looked as if they were dressed in lemon bombazine. Awful. <laughs> Um, now, <laughs> the length is now better, and the stresses are getting a bit softer, but they're still a bit too stiff, stiff that fabric, and the lemon yellow is too striking. Right. The the That's flow it. of the skirts is just so important to the choreography, oh, right? There's so it, many moments where it just right. gets caught up in the perfect way. We used to call it skirt choreography. You know, you get your arm caught and you flip it it's just <laughs> an extra fun thing you know <laughs> well alistair thank you so so much for chatting with us today it's always a pleasure to have you on and we always learn so much and we know that our audience does as well <laughs> thank you very much love you to speak to you conversations on dance is part of the acast creator network for more information visit conversations on dance pod pod.com